in real time, we had business leaders deciding, okay, I need a recommendation of which particular product should I discontinue temporarily in order to maximize the production. We've known all along that everything that's different, anything that requires a change, takes away effective capacity. And so we were very clear with our businesses around this is the way to optimize output. And given that we had way more demand than we had the ability to service, that was a very important discussion that we would do. Welcome to Create New Features, a show about thought-provoking ideas and practices you can use to create and shape your future in life and in business. Join Avi Shahar, author and innovation strategy consultant, as he shares his proven strategies that have helped clients create breakthrough results. Aviv has guided executives at Fortune 100 companies, and now he wants to help you. Welcome to Create New Futures, where we develop conversations with successful leaders and entrepreneurs to explore how you can create new futures for you and for your organization. This is Aviv, and today I'm speaking with John Church. John is a visionary leader with an extraordinary career at General Mills, one of the most admired companies in the world. I have collaborated with John when he was executive vice president, chief supply chain officer, and global business solutions at General Mills. John is one of the most insightful executives I have ever worked with because he brings this rare capacity to integrate the four zones of executive leadership the strategy, the operation, the people, and the numbers. And he's able to go deep in each of those and integrate those dimensions to play the holistic game of leadership. John, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Aviv, great to be with you. I uh, I should have you write my board bio. That's a, that's a terrific and I'm not sure well-deserved uh, introduction, but thank you. Well, let me dive right in and ask you first, what are you discovering about the joys of post-corporate life. So I retired, uh, as you know, February of this year. And it's interesting, I have older children and I also have an 11-year-old. And so I'm experiencing retirement, I think, a little differently than some people. They hear things like, every day is a Saturday, isn't that great? And uh, I am not confused on what day of the week it is. I have things to do and parenting to do, but I have noticed immediately And while I'm still involved in things, just the level of stress is almost immediate the way things change. My historic addiction to my phone, needing to check every ding or every buzz, because it could be something that I potentially was holding up progress on. I'm sure now it's just CNN or ESPN sending me a a news blurb or something I can get to it at some different time. So that changes almost the day everything stops. I consider my retirement a work in progress. I'm spending three or four hours sort of doing things that interest me and probably six or seven hours a week finding things that can interest me and sort of building this portfolio of things I can do to marry with my personal passion. I'm learning how to cook. My kids bought me a guitar. If I golf three more times this year, that'll be two more times than last year. And so there's lots of things for me to become invested in and enjoy. And my oldest daughter, who's 30, she just had a baby in January. And so I'm learning how to be a grandfather, which has been a wonderful joy. That's an awesome discovery journey. It's an interesting comment you just made there about stress, because you once said to me that when everybody is stressed, I know the context was different, but you said then when everybody is stressed, you are not stressed because you've discovered in your career that complex situations require you to evaluate options and make decisions. And that's what leaders do. So just juxtapose that, please. That's a good question. So maybe I'm less anxious. I didn't, I was never the kind of person that hated Sundays. I never felt like, oh, Sunday was a terrible day because I had Monday coming. I enjoyed going to work. I enjoyed who I worked with. In a role like mine, you learn how to deal with your stress by ensuring that you make people below you capable of doing things so that the stress doesn't come your way. But I did have some anxiousness about the daily sort of onslaught of things I had to navigate through. They were all manageable, but sort of ensuring that I had the intentionality to survive my schedule was something I spent a lot of time on, something I don't have to spend as much time on when my calendar goes from 60 hours a week to 10 of scheduled time. 
Well, so let's actually build on this, and we want to bring this dimension of the interior experience of leadership, Mm -hmm. but put it inside the broader context. So at the end of February 2020, just before the pandemic brought the global shutdown, we conducted a strategy event with your team, and we did not know at the end of that week that really a week later, the entire globe was going to get shut down with this extraordinary disruption. We sensed that something big was coming. And I remember you said to me as we departed, you want to see a company that will do well in this time? Just look at us. And it wasn't arrogance. It was an acknowledgement of the capacities and the muscles the company and your organization developed over many years. So you then led the global supply chain and operations through what must have been the strangest, weirdest a professional experience, and mm-hmm. you delivered exceptional results against demands that you couldn't even imagine a few months earlier. So can you walk me, we have time, this is the, the sure. of podcast. Can you walk me through the big items of this journey and what are the key discoveries as you're leading this rolling event as it unfolds? Absolutely. It was interesting. You and I were literally in a conference room together, sort of facilitating my team through what we thought was going to be necessary for success in the next five years. And with more clarity, maybe around the next three and unbeknownst to us, the next two would look nothing like anything we had ever experienced. And a lot of things we envisioned would have to be either sidelined or developed immediately in order to enable the success. I said, I remember the discussion we had and saying, hey, this is where we shine. And I think that you build a company and a culture of people that want to make a difference. And then you overlay leadership clarity, mission and purpose clarity. And then you put together sort of the supporting fibers and processes to make that happen. And good things happen. Also, we're a food company. We're a company that largely is exposed to food at home. And we all saw sort of the shutdown that was starting to work its way across Asia and Europe, coming to North America, where the ballast of our business is, and saw this will likely cause a lot of demand for us. We will be spending a lot of time just dealing with that surge in demand. And to put some numbers around it, I mean, General Mills in the first year to two years of the COVID experience experienced on average, maybe a 15 to 25% lift in its businesses, but some of its businesses immediately experienced a 2000% lift in its business. The challenge for us becomes no one builds a supply chain to be be able to react to that, both the ability to respond quickly, but then even over time, this has been a prolonged event as people weren't going out to eat. They weren't the breakfast they used to take on the run, the the lunch they used to have out at their office in their cafeterias or their place of work. Suddenly, those were all being done at home. And they turned to trusted food providers. And for a while, they turned to anybody who could get product on the shelves in order to make a difference. And so For a company like ours, it became an opportunity, but it also became a responsibility. I mean, the people were in panic and they looked for things that they could count on to help sort of give them something, a sense of normal. And so that became the resounding purpose that we could, we didn't invent. We had that beforehand, the idea of making food people love, the idea of ensuring that we served our customers and consumers but it became very, very pronounced and clear to people. So maybe that was the foundation. This was our time. The bell tolled and we didn't have to ask who it tolled for. And we had to step up. So how do you do that? You have this unprecedented demand. You have a pandemic you're not sure how to operate in. You're concerned about safety and the safety of your employees. And so you have to do some things really, really well. And I think the first thing that we did well it was incredibly important was we had real role clarity. And I mean that corporately, we had role clarity. We had a very small team that was cross-functional, maybe two handfuls of people that were making decisions for how General Mills would act. Things like how we were going to work virtually from the office. How were we going to run our plants? How were we going to, what, what were going to be our policies and procedures in the near term? And these are folks that immersed themselves with outside experts. They modeled, they learned what the WHO could teach us. They learned what CDC could teach us. And we tried our best to put together based on this best thinking, here's how we would operate. That applied to everybody. 
Then at the supply chain level, we became very clear on what we were going to decide centrally and what we were going to just provide direction and touch points for for people. And so as a corporate function, we made decisions like the head of HR and myself would decide if a facility was going to shut down due to the pandemic. We weren't going to allow individual leaders to make those decisions. They would make recommendations. They could they could talk about things and share their concerns. But we didn't want sort of 50 or 70 different leaders deciding how General Mills was going to show up. We wanted to have abject clarity because we knew that clarity and consistency was going to be galvanizing and supportive of our teams. And so we made sure that the decision makers were always the same. They were always provided with the same information. And we made decisions on whether we were going to be in the office or not, whether we were going to have plants running or not. I'm happy to say that actually during the entire experience of COVID, General Mills didn't close any facility. In our offices, we all worked from home, but none of our manufacturing plants closed its operations because we didn't have to. We became very early adopters of masks, temperature screenings. We became early negotiators with healthcare organizations to figure out how we could get vaccinations offered to our employees. And We didn't wait for the CDC to recommend things for us to explore the availability. So when it comes to masks, we had 2 million masks on order before CDC told us that we needed to have masks because we knew it was coming. We saw what had happened in China. We're a global company. We could talk to our compatriots and say, look, this is coming. We know this will add value. And we knew that the worst thing was we were going to have to resell a bunch of masks. And so we allowed that urgency to sort of guide us. It was no regrets types of actions that allowed us to move quickly. And I think too often in crisis, people wait to be right. We instead ensured we just weren't wrong. I think that's a learning that I'll take with me. We did no regrets communication. We shared as much as we could, but we never shared so much detail that we were going to tell you one thing on Monday of Eve, and then we'd get new information on Thursday and tell you something different. We would instead say, look, at this is going to be our plan of action until the third Thursday of the month, and then we'll come back to you and tell you something different based on new information. But what we didn't try to do is overpromise or communicate to you because we felt like that would indeed cause more tension and not provide the security we needed to provide our employees. So let me re-thread through those elements. Number one, the just a preparatory a body of work in the organizational culture, the ethos of the company that has always been there before there was a crisis. You invest in times, in all times, to be ready for the crisis, such that when that arrived, you had a leadership team and an organization that was ready to respond. Number one. Number two, there was a clarity of purpose. You were there to provide uh, food. In terms of food insecurity around the world, you were needing to address that. So the purpose, the mission became the reality you were operating in. Number three, you're very clear about the priorities, safety first, delivery of our standards and commitments second, and everything flows from that. Number four, this unified centralized team that provided clarity about ways and protocols and how will we uh, work And number five, effective communication, promising what you can promise. And then I think within that, going to solve for the next priority items that you needed to solve. So talk to me a little more about that. How do you as a leader with your, you've got 20 different or 40 different or 100 different issues surfacing a day. How do you prioritize? Where do you put your mental focus? So the first thing we had to do was establish an operating cadence to sort of allow people the freedom to operate in an environment where they weren't certain. And so we did things like every plant manager in a region got on a phone call, a video call for 15 minutes to 30 minutes every day at the same time so that we could simply share information, learn from each other and elevate questions to the level that needed to to provide answers. And so As an operator and a leader, you were never more than 24 hours away from getting an answer to a question you had, a concern, et cetera. Because those things happened in real time and the decision makers could be in the room, we didn't end up with emails and backlog and people not talking with each other, but instead we created forums that were regular, repeatable, 
and the agenda was clear and the decision makers were available in a real time to provide the next step, or we elevated it to the next level and we're clear about when they'd have a decision or something coming. That's really the learning from command centers in the armed forces. That's how you operate. Everybody is in that conversation. They get all the answers they need to get every 24 hours. Yes. And that sort of operating model applied not only to our plant operations, but also to our businesses. It became very clear we needed to have command centers and control towers to understand the needs of our customers understand disruptions in a supply chain. I mean, the statistic I heard was we might have had 50 disruptions in our global supply chain. We're a big company, but 50 real disruptions a month. We were getting 500 a month. And so things had to change. We had to make decisions and we had to make decisions in real time. And we needed the business leaders in the room at the time to help us work through those kinds of things so that we could have clarity and we could work with customers in real time. And so it required all of General Mills to come together because as nice of a job as we did of providing reliability from our plants, ensuring production came on time, finding options and opportunities with our suppliers and giving them clear information, people got sick. We had uh, truckers didn't show up. People couldn't show up when they expected. We had suppliers that had issues because they were running faster and more than they ever had before. I mean, think about the supply chain. You suddenly expect it to come up with 200 to 2,000% more capacity. Something's going to break. And while it wasn't usually within our four walls, it was often within our ecosystem. And we had to find ways through that. But the first thing we had to do was make sure we understood what the issue was. We had the decision makers in the room to provide real clear information in real time. And that allowed us then to take the next 24 hours worth of activities and steps. For me, please, a magnifying glass on on this scenario, this cadence of a daily command center type conversation. What are some of the protocols you are there facilitating leading this endeavor? What are the the practices Mm -hmm. that enable that to be as effective as it can be when you have, as you said, so many disruptions that you need to address? So first of all, the important point is I wasn't leading any of them. I was assessing the health of the organization and I was getting my team together initially twice a week and then just once a week. It was really important that we made the decisions at the lowest possible levels and we elevated and escalated only those decisions where we felt like a General Mills answer, a policy answer was required. And so that gets back to our earliest point around role clarity. But in a control tower meeting, we'd talk about, hey, this is our outlook on production. This is our outlook of that production against the demands of the customer. We inevitably, because things like we all read the stories of and maybe experienced personally, the shelves are empty of toilet paper. The shelves are empty of flour. There's things that we just want to get. That led to panic buying, not only from the consumer, but from the customer. And so if we simply would have said the first to the trough gets the food, we would have had a big imbalance and we wouldn't have done right by anybody. And so instead, we had to look at the entire picture, sum it up, a uh, supply versus demand. How do we want to satisfy this? What are the things that make the most sense? In real time, we had business leaders deciding, OK, I need a recommendation of which particular product should I discontinue temporarily in order to maximize the production? We've known all along that everything that's different, anything that requires a change, takes away effective capacity. And so we were very clear with our businesses around, this is the way to optimize output. And given that we had way more demand than we had the ability to service, that was a very important discussion that we would do. So in a daily meeting, we'd talk about the thought this was going to happen, it did or didn't, what do we want to do? And then on a less frequent but equally important basis, we would talk strategically about SKUs, you know, stock keeping units we wanted to have, product variations we wanted to have or not have, why, and who was going to talk to the customer accordingly. And those were difficult discussions, but I will tell you that we got a tremendous amount of feedback, positive feedback from our supplier, or from our both our suppliers and our customers, that at least we were talking. We were being transparent and we weren't constantly changing our mind. We were trying to give them the same clarity that they could operate against. And then we hold them accountable for the fact that we haven't changed our order, so we expect you to deliver what you said you would. What are you learning through this early phases and then as it continues to then roll about the human side of leadership through crisis, the soft side? 
managing, as we said earlier, your own internal anxiety and stress, but also attending to your team. You are there. You need to make decisions, business decisions, supply decisions, strategic decisions. But you're also mo- needing to monitor the mental clarity and the capacity of those individuals to operate through this ambiguity and uncertainty and stress. So there are a couple of things that come to mind. The first one is it wasn't a learning, but it was a reminder of the importance of focus versus syndication. I think oftentimes in a big company, it's natural for the individual and it's natural for the company to try to share everything so that everybody has context, whether or not it's really important to them. And at times of focus, when there's enough within your own four walls, you can't count on because there's disruptions all the time and your job got a lot harder, being very clear on what I want you to do, you being very clear on what you need to do it, and having that be the entirety of our discussion is really important. We didn't spend much time in the first two months talking about employee development. We didn't spend much time talking about you know external relations and reputation. We talked about our consumers, our customers, and our employees, and optimizing that, all we spent our time on. We weren't launching new products. We weren't hypothesizing new and improved. We were simply being very clear on the three or four most important things we should focus on. Every meeting started with safety and the current status of our employees. And that was natural for us. It's pretty tough to build a culture in the middle of a crisis and have it be considered real by the employee base. In our case, we had built that culture, to your point, over time. And as such, we simply leveraged it. I have a saying and a model of, you know, you should always put firewood in your stack because there are going to be some days when the trees are, you can't get at the trees and you have to burn it. And so we spent a fair amount of time burning the equity and the culture that we had put in place, leveraging and benefiting from the fact that we were trusted. People believed us. When we said we were operating in people's best interests, they believed us. And it was critical because that allowed us the credibility to really ask people to do remarkable things, help challenges they faced, et cetera. So the first one is focus. The second one is this idea of communication, clarity, frequency, and transparency. I think certainly General Mills, but but myself, it's easy to sort of, I'm going to wait until I know the answer. And these answers were unknowable. We knew we were in a time of disruption where No matter what I said with clarity, I may have to change. And so being very transparent and frequent around the communication saying, I don't know, here's what we're doing today. And if we find out something different, we'll do something different tomorrow. That was a new muscle for us to build. You know, as a leader, you like having the right answer. And Mm. instead, I had to be very clear that we didn't have the answers, but this is what we knew. And as such, this is what we were operating under. That didn't build lack of trust. That didn't build skepticism, that built absolute followership, because they knew that everything we could tell them we did, and we weren't making it up. And I think that was really important when it was obvious that no one knew the answers to these questions. We didn't know how the disease was spreading. We didn't know the outcomes that to expect or not. And we had seen some of our competitors have very bad outcomes that we weren't experiencing because of how we were navigating and leading along the way. And because of really the investment you've made years and years and years in in advance in in the organizational culture and the ethos. So you came into leadership through the 90s and the early 2000s. This was Thomas Friedman, the world is flat kind of a universe where supply chains were all about efficiency, just in time, seamless flow of global commerce. And in the last couple of years, and certainly through that experience, but even before on the run up to that, We are seeing that there are supply shortages, global tensions. The world is no longer so flat as as we thought it was going to be. Perhaps even the global reserve currency of the dollar is going to be challenged in the coming decade in one way or another, if not completely replaced. At least that regime is going to be fragmented. So what, how, and by the way, what I have learned from in the early training in the Air Force, I took some time, I studied all the people that survived well those that were shot down and survived as POWs. And the key message from all those that have done well, relatively survived, was they were able to make the mental switch over. I'm no longer flying a powerful machine. The game has changed. I now need to survive in a different game. And it's a bit like that coming through a a disruptive 
event that is not just short-term disruptive, but is paradigm shifting for the entire architecture of supply. You now need to think not just one objective about efficiency. You now need to consider resiliency. So what is your... First, talk about that shift in your experience, and then I'm interested, what comment could you offer, not with a crystal ball, but at least an outlook, a mid to long term, given how you're seeing the world evolving? Thank you for the question. I've done a lot of thinking about this, and I think you characterized it right. I literally bought The World is Flat for everyone on my leadership team, and we talked about, we had a book club to talk about what this meant to us. I had a role at General Mills called Global Sourcing Development, which was all about how do you get the furthest flung, most efficient supply chains that made sense and leverage just in time and lean thinking and all of the stuff that we sort of held near and dear to our hearts. And we were emboldened by two things. One was incredibly cheap oil. So the ability to transport things wasn't that big of a deal. We didn't really understand the impact of sustainability and carbon footprint at that point. And so it also wasn't a tremendous conversation in the, certainly in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And we were benefited from what we thought was going to be global trade and bilateral trade agreements, you know, free trade agreements all over the world. And then nationalism starts stepping in and there's a retrenching of, you know, whether it's Brexit or tariff barriers with China and the U.S. and those kinds of things start challenging all of those assumptions. And it's been an interest. And then you overlay with that 500 disruptions in your supply chain a month versus 50, an optimal, tightly strung, very efficient supply chain doesn't necessarily have the resilience to survive that. but. There are some foundational things, regardless, that are important. Operations excellence, the standards you need to run a safe operation, the engagement and the the skills of the employees, the communication to the employees so that they know what the business mission is, they understand the role they can play, they understand how important they are, Uh, they're rewarded so that they're incentivized to do the right thing. All of that's required. And once you have that in place, it's a lot easier to change what you want them to do. It's when instead you're telling everyone what they should do. They're not acting on their own behalf because they don't really have any information to make their own decisions. You don't have processes in place to help people learn and grow. Then it becomes really challenging. So as I tell everybody, all of the things around operations excellence, around fundamental operating strategies, resolve necessary and the predictability necessary to run good operations, that didn't go away when agility happened. You just need a lot more tools because what you're going to be using that predictability and foundation for changes. So the first thing that needs to happen is you can't be an operations organization. You have to be a business organization. And early on, as this change happened, the tension between our business partners and the operations teams was incredible because Mm -hmm. the businesses knew they weren't being successful because they were being asked to do all kinds of different things. The operations team knew they weren't being successful because all of these different things were more expensive, didn't meet the model we had built, the level of disruption causing us to lose that predictability we had sustained. But once you could find your foundation, you can find your way through. And once you have that, that's where you start having these wonderful discussions around data and analytics. Okay, Okay, I can no longer spot a trend myself, but can I let real data scientists pick out things that I couldn't have seen because of the complexity, and can that guide my decision making? That's where you can take a look at machine learning and have things become predictable, the visibility that's enabled now in the supply chain so that I know where a truck is, I know what temperature it's at, I know when my materials will be there, I can spot them on a map, I know what the traffic route looks like. I mean, the things that now can provide information for better decision making can start addressing all of those agility concerns, but there has to be a foundation and response and a predictability underneath all of that. So I wouldn't say that we've had to abandon everything we built. We've had to simply mature and add additional capabilities. Most of them will become digital. I will tell you in all honesty, during COVID, every tech magazine wanted me to give an interview that talked about all the technology we had done. And as I've mentioned to you already, it was brute force, it was culture, and it was people process. We weren't suddenly enabling great technology to help us solve these problems. We enabled great people and made them ex- excellent through process. But 
that can now be automated, but that can now be fed with additional visibility and digitization of the supply chain that I think will help sort of with the transition and the transformation. Because I don't think we're going to go back. You know, People learned that they could get almost everything in the world delivered to their house directly, and they never have to leave their homes anymore. People that can afford it are never going to go back to being their own delivery people. And as such, that's a capability we're going to have to sustain as you know, manufacturers and people that serve our customers. So the ambidexterity you're describing through dramatic disruptive change, first, recognize those fundamental practices and operating procedures, the foundation that must be part of the future. You don't want to do away with that. And then second, recognize where and how the world is changing and what are the new tools and new capabilities that you must develop. You need to bring those two inquiries all at the same time. You do. And the other thing that we overlaid, and I learned this actually with you in the room, we recall that we had a manufacturing leader who brought this idea of possibilities thinking. It's too easy when you run an operation, when you run a supply chain that's held to a predictable level of performance, everything out of the norm seems hard and probably counter to your abject reliability. And so there tends to be this natural antibody that comes out to say, yep, no, I don't want to do that. The reality is that in order to survive in this world, we adopted this philosophy of possibilities thinking, which was, well, I can't do that now, but in order for me to do it, we'd need this, we'd need that, and we'd need this other thing. Well, those can all be built. Those can all be solved. If instead you said, what would need to be true in order to meet, to be successful in this new state, it leads to different conclusions. And so you have to be very married to the things that make you reliable and predictable and not in any way married to the things that potentially can hold you back. You simply have to know that in a new normal, in a new paradigm, these other things would have to be met in order for you to be successful. That was a conversation starter for us that allowed us to continue to evolve our thinking. And I think that mindset and sometimes literally the behaviors to do that is important. So the practice you're describing is we ask people to paint the horizon three future that is daring and compelling against the purpose and the mission that we envision. And then we ask in the horizon to tell us what must be true in to make the bridge to enable uh, that future before we leave this space and travel to earlier in your career and learn a bit more about your journey. Any other comment you'd offer about just where you see the world in terms of the next decade and what can we add up from this? We have no idea what's going to happen with China. We have no idea what's going to happen with Russia. There are so many unknowns in this world. So what are business leaders to do in a world like this to address the near term, but also prepare for the mid and long term? For sure. My successor at General Mills actually sort of made this observation very succinctly. He said, we have historically grown up and aspired to creating a demand-driven supply chain that where the consumer moves, that drives the entirety because we've built this network. When someone eats a bowl of Cheerios, which is made with oats as the grain, a harvester starts up in Canada to harvest the next bushel. That should be the perfection of a supply chain. The reality is in today's world, we've become supply constrained. For the first time ever, we're a supply constrained supply chain. The supply itself will determine what the business will be able to do. And that requires a level of collaboration and real-time thinking as business leaders that hasn't been necessarily required in the past. We've been able to sort of say, what do you want to go do? Okay, we'll go do that excellently. And we understand, don't worry about it, we'll take care of the mission. Now the mission itself has to be defined by the capabilities. And so I think it'll lead to, first of all, much more collaboration internally. Because the businesses that will be successful are the ones that can marry what they can do with what they can make money at, as opposed to dream of what they should be making money at and then find they can't do it and then point fingers at each other. So I think that's a foundational thing on the inside. On the outside, I think this has been part of our continuous evolution. Those who collaborate and partner the best will win. I believe in Take the model of Uber or Lyft in the US, Kareem in the Middle East, where I'm willing to drive. I don't care who I drive. I'm on an app and I'm digitally enabled and I can, and I'm willing to use my car, not yours. And the fact that we are all on the same platform allows for a business to be successful. 
Well, that could happen with factories. That can happen with supply bases. That could happen with freight to a customer. There's opportunities for us to now with more information, optimize what those supply chains look like, but we're going to have to learn how to get along. We're going to have to learn how to win-win. And there might be times where we agree to split the difference as opposed to look for a competitive advantage in everything we do. Being smarter about where we're going to add unique competitive advantage and where we're simply going to commoditize and optimize the asset base. I think that'll be an interesting discussion. Many, many companies have built these large, wholly owned infrastructure for competitive advantage. I think over time, we find ways to share those together because it's more efficient, it's better for the environment, and because it provides more resilience. I would much rather have 500 trucks of which I need three than three trucks of which I need three. And so when you think about resilience and where we go to, more optionality is important. That means we're going to have to make strange bedfellows potentially than we, stranger than we've had before. On the interior side of a company, you're describing collaborative leaders. And I think you're saying you cannot just be a functional leader. You're going to have to be a business leader in every function wherever you operate. So that's on the interior. On the exterior, you're describing an agnostic network-like platforms that enable collaborative and distributive engagements, plug and play scenarios that completely, well, not completely, we've been moving into that space for the last couple of decades, but increasingly moving into that kind of agnostic distributed scenarios where you can plug and play. Yeah. And it's not that there won't be some businesses and some companies that have unique competitive advantage that are going to want to protect. But I think that we've come from a place where Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do. We've historically wanted to control everything. And now I think that we should control only things that we're uniquely qualified to control, where it makes a real difference. Everything else arguably ought to be commoditized. And I think digitization will allow that to be the case. Those who do that the best, I think, will win because they will be as efficient as they can be and have far more optionality than people that have built sort of internal, not flexible supply chains. Let's trace to earlier in your career and journey and ask, um, how did you discover what you're good at? So you just take me through the early stages of your career. And what is the moment where you say, I think I'm going to be good at that. That's what I want to do. Take me through that early journey. So, So I started at General Mills in product development. And so I was a research and developer developing new Cheerios. Multigrain Cheerios was my claim to fame. And so I was literally thinking about formulation and molecules and pressures and temperatures and equipment design and those sorts of things. And what became really clear was in order to launch any new product that required new materials and sometimes new science and new qualification of vendors and working all the way through the complexity of ecosystem was required to be successful. So I had this drive for success and it was just foisted upon me. That was complex. There was going to be multi-stakeholders. They were going to have their own points of view. At the very least, I needed to create win, not lose situations. And in best case, win-win situations for people who people are members of those that ecosystem. But I will tell you that while I appreciated and learned in that environment, I learned the different functional expertise and how people married that and brought that to the success of an organization and a project. And I found that I could galvanize those folks toward a goal. I could appreciate what they brought uniquely, but I didn't let it get in the way of what we were trying to do. That was probably as we were launching new products, I was able to start building some of that capacity. I will tell you, though, large organizational leadership didn't happen until I was put in a manufacturing plant, and I realized that just because I knew how to make cereal better than everybody else, because I had literally designed the cereal, didn't mean that I had 250 people who were doing that on a daily basis. I was getting the most out of them, or that just because one person knew how to do it, that we could do it at scale. And so the learnings around how to take this idea of a complex situation when everybody brings their own biases, their own thinking, their own unique talents, and turn that into something that we can all win in. I learned it maybe in product development, but I honed it in a manufacturing environment where you have to get 200, 300, 500, 700, and some of our plants, 1,500 people 
aligned toward a mission, towards a goal. At the end of my career, we had 22,000 people in global operations. And while certainly they all had their own motivations and they brought their own things to the party, they were not confused on what it was General Mills was trying to achieve, what it was global operations was trying to achieve along the way. And so it started pretty early, but I'll tell you, I wasn't any good at it until 15 years of doing it. And I will tell you that there was still plenty to learn when I retired. It is a process that doesn't stop. So what is centering or formative moment for you there in the early journey when you're realizing that, okay, I may be the smartest person in the room, but that's actually not the most important qualifier. It is about how I'm enabling the other people. So it's not about showing everybody else how smart I am. I actually need to engage them in co-creating the solution. How are you coming to discover and realize that operating system? I call the transformation smart, not wise versus why is not smart. I thought I was paid to be smart, but it wasn't very wise. And over time, I developed the wisdom to allow everyone else to bring their smarts to the party because for sure, they were smarter about their particular area than I was. And then if I could tap into that, it could become bigger. So I thought about this. I think it was always forged in crisis. General Mills, we had an unfortunate event where a third-party contractor sprayed the wrong pesticide for economic gain on their part on some of our oats, and we had to remove almost all of our cereal products off the shelf in 1995. And we shut down every cereal plant in the company. At that time, cereal was 60% of the profits and the, and the sales of the company. And I was a 26 or 7-year-old going into the manufacturing plant, and I had to go tell people whose very life depended on us running the manufacturing plant, because that's where their income came from, and they were paid by the hour, that we had to shut everything down and that it wasn't clear to me what the next step was after that because we didn't know where we're going to get our grains from. We didn't know where we're going to get our clean supply of unadulterated pesticide oats. I had to write that speech on the way into the plant. I got a call. I was mowing my lawn. My plant manager said, go shut your plant down. Go shut your processes down. I changed out of shorts into my uniform and went into the plant and brought everybody in the plant together and told them what we were going to go do. I didn't make it up. I told them what I knew. I told them what truths I held to be self-evident around safety and around the important role we played and how this wasn't going to be forever. We were a good company. We were going to be resilient. We'd figure it out. But I didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. And I would tell them tomorrow what was going to be needed tomorrow. And that was maybe my earliest learning in terms of how you really lead in a critical situation, how you give people what they need. You give them some hope. And then the other thing is, I engage them in, how do you think we should do this? We are in a place we've never been faced with this before. How, what do you think we should do? And allowing people to bring their suggestions, me being visible and available and ensuring my leaders were visible and available, allowed for all the best thinking from all over the organization to come to focus on what was important, which was getting the plant down safely, getting it cleaned up safely, and getting it ready to run whenever the materials became available. The upshot of that is, The plant I was at was the first one that was available and as such got the first materials that we could find in the whole corporation and was the first one back up and running. While other plants were down for weeks at a time, we were back up and running in four or five days. And it's because we engaged the people, we were clear about it, and we knew that our role for the success of General Mills was to do exactly what was in front of us and nothing more. That focus became a rallying point. Clarity about values and imperatives, open and transparent communication, and engaging your people to solve together to the desired future state. Yes, absolutely. The other example I lean on is another manufacturing example where we had had an issue in the plant. We had had a fire and it had taken the plant down and it was no one was hurt, luckily, but there was enough damage to the facility into the equipment that there was a lot of concern on how quickly we could get back up an operation. And as I walked in the next day and I heard the operations coordinator kind of thinking through, okay, this has to get done in true functionally excellent fashion. Every functional expert came up with their timeline to get back to perfection and, and what was going to be required. And so the people in charge of cleaning the plant said it's going to take us this long. The people in charge of electrically, the electrical system said it's then, okay, then it could take us this long. And what happened naturally was, well, when you're done, then you hand me the baton. And when I'm done, I'll hand you the baton. And it became a, in seven or eight months, we'll be back up and running the manufacturing plant. 
And I knew that that wasn't reasonable, but it was people with their expert, bringing their expertise to bear solving their own individual problem, as opposed to the problem in front of us, which is we have to make cereal safely and high quality. And so instead they solved their own bit and piece, but they weren't solving the problem holistically. So I listened and I was getting more and more frustrated. And finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, and it was actually, it's possibilities thinking, right? I said, I need a plan that gets us back up and running in six days. Tell me what that looks like and what you need in order for that to happen. And you could feel the tension in the room. Originally, everyone caught their breath because it sounded incomprehensible that that could be the case. And then there was this huge exhale when suddenly they were told their job was to make cereal not the be the best electrician they could be, be the best production manager they could be, be the best. But instead, we had to come together and make trade-offs so that we could ensure our employees were safe and our food was of a high quality. That's all that had to happen. Whether or not it was sustainable long-term wasn't important to me. We could fix those things over time. I don't need to get back to operations at a steady state level for a long time. I need to get back up and running. What does that need to look like? When I took the barriers off of people, suddenly all of their innovation came in. They could bring their best to the table because they were focused on what was our goal as opposed to what was their responsibility. That changed the model and allowed them to be at their best. And we actually had the plant up and running again in four and a half days, much ahead of my request and months ahead of what they had originally envisioned as they started the discussion. What is it all saying about human nature and about our capacity to be innovative? The common thread in what you're describing is through crisis, we learn about what we can do. And by transcending the siloed focus to a unifying bigger goal or bigger mission, we are able to develop solutions and innovations that we would never otherwise access. Yes. I mean, I think that when you develop a superpower, that superpower tends to be the thing you focus on. And any team needs leaders to bring them together and say, Aviv, but what I need your superpower to do is achieve this for us. And now suddenly you start tailoring your, how you show up and what you bring to the party around a goal that we've all accepted. And I think too often we build functional excellence without building outcome excellence. We have to start there and then we can build functional excellence as needed in order to improve the output, in order to achieve the goal together. I think sometimes, and certainly I was guilty of this and learned it literally the hard way, you instead need to be just what's needed at the time. And that frees up people to contribute not only to the best of their expertise, maybe as their resume might say, but to the best of what they bring to the party as people that maybe you wouldn't have thought they were qualified to bring if you would have been assembling the team in the first place. So then along your journey from leading a plant with 250 people, you end up leading a large organization of 22,000 people. And along that journey, there is the aspect of transferring these learnings to leading leaders that lead leaders. There are some threads that you take on to that executive leadership. What are the changes? What are the discoveries you've made as you transcended to these later roles in, in the company where it's essentially enabling leaders to achieve their success and you are there to enable them? So as I have built my leadership perspective, first of all, there has been a bit of trial by fire. I've also been very comfortable building my leadership in public. What does that mean, building your leadership in public? I'm okay being vulnerable knowing that this is, I provide context for people, not only in terms of the situation, but then Based on that, here's how I think about it so that they can, one, understand my logic, and then two, challenge my logic. I think that to the extent that I can be vulnerable as a leader and share what I think is important and what I'm not willing to compromise on, in my case, human safety, consumer safety, our protecting the environment, those types of things, the protecting the reputation of General Mills and my General Mills role. Other than that, Pretty much everything was negotiable as long as we weren't breaking laws. And so then the question becomes, okay, if we're treating people right and we're navigating through, this is how I think about it. And I would be open and candid around my motivations and how I thought about things, not because I thought they were right, because I thought it would spur discussion. That would allow people to build and bring their thinking to the party. 
The other thing I had to learn is this was the big transformation. You made the comment about it. You know how to be the formulator. You know how to make the cereal. But I didn't know how to make cereal. I knew how to make a molecule of cereal. I didn't know how to make it at scale. Well, similarly, if you're caught up in all of the details, then you miss the lead. You miss the big picture. And so, as you've seen, my direct reports would never accuse me of being too far into the details because I provided the context and I had clarity in terms of what it is we needed to achieve. And we talked about whether we were or weren't, but I didn't, I was able to be comfortable that I didn't have to have the right answer. I simply had to have the right questions and ensure, or ensure even better that the right questions were being asked. And what that led to for me in terms of my personal growth was developing a very clear intentionality about how I showed up. And I was at my best when I had thought about what's the purpose of me being in this room, on this call, in this area? What's the purpose of me having a one-on-one discussion with this junior person, with this senior person I'm mentoring or coaching? What is it they most need from me? How am I going to do that at the least amount of energy so I have energy to spare for the next thing I can't see coming? And how can I ensure that I'm not doing their work for them? Thoughtful and planful around that became something that was really important because I couldn't have survived. I couldn't have stretched myself if I felt like I had to know the answers. Now, that isn't always satisfactory. And sometimes I had to recontract with my boss who said, I said, I don't know, but I can find out. And I think they were surprised because, well, you're in charge of operations. And I said, I'm in charge of a lot of operations, which is why I don't know the answer to that question, but I can find out the answer. I had to be comfortable with being really thoughtful in terms of how I would engage. And when I was at my best, I did that really, really well. I will tell you there were times and probably there were times all the time for people where administrative things, a lot of things came your way and I lost that clarity and intentionality. And then I just survived my days and I wasn't at my best. I wasn't giving my best and I wasn't full of energy. I wasn't bringing additional things. And I was probably standing in the way of the progress of the organization if I would have been smarter and better. It takes us all the way back to what I learned during COVID, right? If you're clear and focused, if you manage the process, you give people exactly what they need and no more, then you'll get the best out of folks. What you described there, John, is is the leadership vulnerability to be able to embrace not knowing. Would you say that was a natural intuition? Was that an acquired, developed capacity, something you matured into? Some leaders get trapped or struggle with that sense. They don't easily find the sense of the way of being a vulnerable leader because we actually need to be comfortable and strong and confident inside that sense of uncertainty. What was your journey with that capacity? I knew my organization very well. I was a 33-year General Mills employee. I spent 20-plus years of that in the operations world. I had led the global supply chain for 15 years, and out of 13 years, something like that. And as such, I had a remarkable amount of faith, and I'd seen lots of things happen, and they always work out. So then it became, what are the things I need to do in order to enable that next thing to happen? That is, and to your point, my vulnerability stems from my confidence. If I wasn't grounded, if I didn't have sort of foundation personally for me to step from and lead from, then I would be defensive and worried and micromanaging and all of the things that tend to get in the way of people. I, on the other hand, to our earliest discussion around, do you get stressed? The answer is, no, we'll figure this out. The board of directors would ask me oftentimes, what is it that keeps you up awake at night? And nothing keeps me up awake at night. Not a thing. There are things we're going to need to do better, but I don't worry about us doing our job because I know the people that are there doing them. I've engaged with them. A fact, I have an unusually high level of sort of need for affiliation and teamwork. When you do the personality assessments, my sort of the way I engage and I show up is totally the antithesis of this standard executive. It's not that the standard executive couldn't do a great job doing my job. They just would do it differently. I showed up with this affiliation, this trust, this belief in people that if I gave them the information and the tools and I was there to catch them or hold them accountable, and I was there to reward them and help support them, that we would achieve great things. And sure enough, more often than not, we did. You have mentored and coached so many people along these years. What have you developed as the key principles 
that guide your mentoring and coaching when people ask for your advice? So I spend a lot of time making sure they know what their goal actually is. That's why I ask them, what is it you're trying to get after here? What is the, oftentimes they want to know what to do and they oftentimes know what to do, but they haven't asked, they haven't asked the right question yet, or they haven't determined what they actually wanted to go achieve. And so spending time drawing people out around that. I do believe that this idea of we all operate in an ecosystem. And so understanding stakeholders, what their motivations are. How do you think they'll show up? What do you think's on that person's mind when you go in and you're going to talk about this? What's their natural response going to be? And what do you think we could do differently or you could do differently in order to prepare them to be a positive part of this meeting, a positive part of this interaction? I spend a lot of time coaching and mentoring on that. Even in retirement, I've found that this idea of clarity of the goal, stakeholder analysis and what sorts of tactics we can do to bring alignment and confederation to helping drive alliance, alliances to drive forward. Then the last thing I spend a lot of time is intentionality. This idea of if you are just surviving your day, then you will let entropy decide where your day goes. And it's impossible to lead and drive forward if you simply assume that Outlook has figured out how to get things done at your corporation. Instead, you need to be remarkably clear on what needs to get done and ensure that Outlook is working on your behalf and not the other way around. And that level of intentionality is something that I coach and ask people to think about all the time. Now, in fairness, it's sometimes it was do as I say, not as I do, because sometimes it's hard and you are finding yourself surviving your day. But the reality is things don't get done unless people do unique. The status quo always is going to be the result of entropy and inertia, unless somebody takes action to do something remarkably different. And then the question is, have you built alliance to do that? Have you been thoughtful in terms of how you're going to drive that in every engagement you have throughout your day? Because to the extent you're able to do that, then you build a, you know, a team, a cohort that can help drive and do unique and remarkable things. My closing three questions. First, perhaps building on what you just offered there now with this sense of intentionality and clarity about alliances and what you're trying to produce. So with all that you know today, what advice would you give a 25-year-old entering the workforce, trying to figure out what they are going to be and become and do? I think the important capabilities for people entering the workforce is this understanding of what technology can and can't do. And in the world, how, do they, how does technology interface with the actual world? In supply chain speak, Aviv, that's, there's a lot of people who understand the physical supply chain, but they don't understand how come the system is telling it to do something different because they don't understand which gets done at what place, by whom, what data is being used, what's the algorithm, understanding sort of the context of where technology meets actual sorts of reality is an important thing. And whether you are in the tech world and in data and analytics, and that's your expertise and superpower, or you're simply observing and knowing about how it impacts the real physical world, being able to see and understand that is the next level of systems thinking. For me, systems thinking was understanding the different players in the supply chain and the different cohorts and whether they were inside or outside of my company. Tomorrow and increasingly today, it's that what's happening right in front of me and what's happening in the ether and how do those two things connect? I think that's an important skill. The ability to understand people and collaborate with people. Again, I think this Uberization and the ability to work with others that aren't necessarily in your company in order to achieve something great together, I think will be a differentiator for people. And then I think there's a really understanding yourself nowadays, this component. We spent a lot of time during COVID with this concept of put your, first, your own oxygen mask on first. Your mental health is being challenged like it never has before. You need to make sure that you can show up in order to be any good to help anybody else. I think that there's my leadership would spend much more time having people think about their foundation, what they're leading from, how they're feeling grounded, because that will allow them to bring their superpowers to bear. For me, that was around foundation of my family and then the ability to communicate to people. 
because I cared about them, because I could appreciate that they had different perspectives than me. You can have all the best ideas in the world. If you can't cause leadership to happen, if you can't cause an action because of it, then it's a waste. No innovation happens from ideas. Innovation happens from the movement of those ideas into the marketplace. And that happens through activity and change. If you were to lose all that you know and keep only two ideas or two capabilities or two practices, what would you keep? For me, there'd be the two things would be one, this, this willingness to understand and leverage the stakeholders, the complexity of the environment and understanding what drives people, what they can bring uniquely and what's going to be important to them. Some people call that audience analysis. If you're speaking to a large group, for me, as you're trying to get some things done, it's around just understanding the participants and what their motivations are, how to influence them, how to leverage them, how to make them feel comfortable. That stakeholder analysis would be one. And then the ability to communicate clearly and simply what the next step is. The too often people can talk about the big picture or they can talk about the stuff that's in the minutia, but it's in, but it's very difficult to link the two. If you can talk about the next step, what's the next thing required in order to move us forward? Those are hard to argue with and you tend to get to where you want to go by taking that first step forward. Progress versus perfection. Tremendous amount of rich uh, nuggets of wisdom and experience in, in this conversation, John. So as we bring this to lending, what parting a message would you offer to people listening to create new features? Understand where you want to go. Be really clear about the place where you can add unique value and be proud of that. Have that bring you comfort and confidence as you show up and appreciate all the people different from you who bring their superpowers. And don't view that as a threat or a weakness, but instead a gift that you can leverage for the success of your team, of your group, of your organization. Too often we find ourselves threatened by people that bring things that are different than us, as opposed to delighting from the fact that they can bring a perspective that you don't have to expend the same amount of energy being half as good at. So I think that would solve a lot of problems for a lot of different issues in the world of Eve. If we could simply be a little more appreciative of the diversity of thought, perspective, and talents the universe brings. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much. Great to see you. Thanks for the time. Thank you for listening. Aviv always encourages his clients to identify the one or two ideas they can move forward into action immediately. What will you capture and apply today? You can always begin with a small action and then build momentum over time. When you move forward from an idea to action, you get immediate ROI, return on the time you invested, and return of learning. And then the learning cycle builds the success propulsion. One more thing. You can reach Aviv directly by phone and email to discover how he can help you create a new future for your business and organization. Creating your new future can begin today.